if you if we want to have full-time benefits with Jesus we must stop being part-time Christians if we want to have a full-time benefit from Christianity it has to be not a part-time Christianity for us everything we see in the Bible the benefits are for full-time Christians there's just only one problem if you spend your whole life if your whole life is spent like this this is what happens and then you name it claim it blab it grab it confess it possess it he will supply all my needs he will bless me the Lord is my shepherd I shall not lack and so we begin to confess the full-time benefits we lay claim to the full-time benefits but there's just one problem if you are a part-time Christian you can get the full-time benefits and either live for God or live for the world because you're depriving yourself from enjoyment or indulgence of both be hot or cold Jesus says but please don't be warm because you are hurting yourself by not getting full benefits of neither of the worlds you're not fully enjoying the world because you have enough God to make you feel horrible about it and then you aren't enjoying God because you have enough of the world that God is grieved with and it's sitting and living on the limbo it's sitting on the fence it's being friend it's trying to keep the best of both worlds and really losing both of them Joshua you follow Jesus it's all or nothing and when he calls you you better drop everything and go after him some make the commitment they go back to their normal life and instead of changing the way they live they go back to the old habits of the flesh but if you are going to follow Jesus you need to make up your mind that it's for life. let you know if the Lord is God let's serve him and he is not don't do it don't don't deprive yourself of joy I remember one kid and I've shared this many times and I'll share it many more because it illustrates the power of the gospel precious child a kid came in young man and the youth service and looked at me in the lobby and he says is it wrong for me to smoke weed and I said for you no he said you gotta be he said what about having sex I'm like for you of course not and I said look at this you're going to hell you know that I know that your mama knows that your school counselor knows that because he got kicked out of the school and I said everybody knows that I said what difference will it make if you go to head and you smoke pot or you never smoked I said if I would be in your shoes I would smoke as much as I can so that when I go there at least I knew that I didn't deprive myself from the indulgence of sin I said you on the other hand is a horrible sinner because you're trying to hold yourself back I said I'm a better follower of Jesus than you are a sinner I was like I go all the way you're not going now's the time to say Lord you are my priority it's time to build the house of the Lord it's time to build the kingdom of God will you build will you begin to make strides to enhancing your spiritual life saying I'm gonna spend more time this year in fasting and prayer than on TikTok and Instagram I'm gonna spend more time in my prayer closet than I am watching the office I'm gonna spend more time evangelizing and sharing the gospel than I am sharing gossip I'm gonna spend more time in God's power I'm gonna spend more time in God's presence than I am doing all these other things There's, come on I, I had a friend who's an influencer whatever that means and he's just like come on bro he's like I know you watch movies you're like you're not telling me you don't watch movies and you don't go out to eat with people and you don't drink and you're you're not telling me like you don't you and your wife don't go to the new movie that comes out the new love and he's naming all these things I'm like no literally I'm talking about every single day every waking moment I am consumed by the power the presence the anointing the fire of God well, what about your hobby he's my hobby deliverance is my hobby miracles are my hobby prayer is what would what would, what would happen if someone said what's your hobby and you said prayer Are there prayers my hobby worships my hobby you know what happened pastors would stop having to go on sabbaticals because they burned out I would burn out too if I was you if I was preaching with no power never seeing miracles never seeing deliverances never having prayer meetings never seeing the power of God you don't need a sabbatical pastor you need deliverance you need to get free from every gizmo and gadget and trinket and vice of this world and to go all in for God and this preaching scares you because you still want the world and adding God to it well, on today's episode, we are going to be talking about repentance and lukewarm Christianity and what that looks like in some circles of the charismatic, the hyper charismatic, the new apostolic reformation, kind of lumping them all together and seeing how that compares to what scripture has to say on this. When some people refer to Revelation chapter three as the only passage, by the way, that talks about being lukewarm and using that specific word. What does that even mean? Uh, biblically, what can we take away from that? Can we have an understanding of hot, cold, and lukewarm in the proper context? And I'm also going to share some uh, personal thoughts with you, some commentary along the way as we look at a very well-known social media influencer's sermon two years ago about lukewarm Christianity. And I'm going to just provide some thoughts for you along the way. 
food for thought and also point you to an article that I believe kind of helps us understand what's being taught here. So hope you're ready to dive in. Let's take a look today at lukewarm Christianity. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. Well, thanks for joining me today on this program. I think it's going to be very helpful. I certainly hope so. This was actually inspired by a recent listener commenting on one of my YouTube videos and asking if I could cover this particular topic of lukewarm Christianity within this movement versus what scripture says. So I think this is very practical and something that's worth doing. And after listening to this sermon, I've listened to it twice now and just taking some mental notes along the way and then listening to what lukewarm Christianity actually means in uh, the context of scripture. So let's go ahead and listen to some of the clips from Isaiah Saldivar. And the title of this video was Lukewarm Christians, I'm Begging You to Watch This. So here's the first clip, and I'll stop it along the way as we go. You begin to lift up your voice in worship. There is supernatural power when you begin to lift up your voice in praise. So Daniel said, you can shout, you can praise. There's only one thing you're not allowed to do tonight. You are not allowed to sit back quiet and act like God has not done something. I refuse to be around a bunch of lukewarm people that act like God hasn't delivered them. I refuse to be around a bunch of people but act like God hasn't set them free. If you've been delivered, praise like it. If you've been healed, shout like it. If you've had your life turned around, if God has broke the shackles, if God has broke the chains, if God has healed your mind, if God, I came to preach tonight, if God has restored your marriage, if God has empowered you by his Holy Spirit, come on, I was an atheist when the hand of God changed me. I was an atheist when God spoke to me. And I know some of you are down there, why do you have to shout that way? Why? That's my religious voice, by the way. Why do you have to praise that way? You doesn't take all that. Why are you up there shouting? And my question to you is, why are you down there dying? Instead of asking the church why they're shouting, why don't we ask the religious folk why they're so dead? I came to come against every religious spirit every religious power i'm telling you tonight the devil's stock market is crashing well i don't know about some of y'all but i have been in services for years in the past where there was a working up and i participated in 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 doing this um in youth ministry and stuff and working up the crowd and you know there's this undertone of this type of practice and belief uh, by those that hold this type of belief as far as what they view as lukewarm Christianity in this movement. And they view it as if you're standing here like this and you're not saying anything and you're not moving, you're not jumping, you're not shouting, you're not praising, you're not screaming, you're not yelling in tongues. If you're not, and some of, some people won't listen to this may think I'm exaggerating. I'm actually not exaggerating, <laughs> but there, there are some of leaders that will believe if you're not exuberant enough, then you're dead. And there's no thought to this of, well, me, me um, exuding emotion doesn't mean that I'm spiritually alive. There are pagans that do this. There are people that are unregenerated that can easily hoot and holler and shout and do all kinds of things. That doesn't mark them as being born again. That doesn't mark them as being fervent for God. This is from the very beginning. This was the, the tone that was set and it was all throughout um, kind of beating the sheep in a way as, as you'll hear some of it. It's kind of like this, just you're not doing enough. You're not fasting enough. You're not praying enough. You're not doing this, this and this enough. And then saying, oh, well, you're anointed. You're going to come after the gates of hell and, and you're um, you're a battering ram against the devil. I mean, you're, you'll hear some of this talk later, but it's like this up and down roller coaster ride of like beating the sheep a little bit. For those that are sheep and then um you know working them back up again building them back up and beating them back down again it's just like you're not doing enough and then there's this attack on the religious so if anybody is to question any of this and saying well wait a minute 
you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, praising God. There's nothing wrong with being fervent. Scripture tells us to be fervent for the Lord, that we need to um, have passion for his gospel, that we need to be, quote, on fire for the Lord, as many of us know that terminology. We are to be passionate and, and alive and have fervency in our faith and sharing the gospel and such. But sometimes we have a false equivalency in our minds of if I shout louder or if I lift my hands more, um, then that means I'm more passionate than that person over there. And so anybody who questions is automatically said, oh, you have a religious spirit, as you're going to hear in this next clip. And there is a demonic power out to kill the move of God. It's a real spirit, friend. It's a real power called religion. And it uses pastors. It uses leaders. It uses YouTubers. It uses Facebookers. It uses religious influencers. And the spirit of religion doesn't respect person. It will use anybody to further its agenda of quenching out the move of God. The spirit of religion wants to stop deliverance. The spirit of religion wants to stop miracles. The spirit of religion takes the super out of the supernatural God that we serve and all you're left with is a dry I'm preaching truth y'all is a dry dead religious far off God that doesn't heal anybody that doesn't have the power to break heroin addiction that doesn't have the power to restore marriages that doesn't have the power to transform a homosexual that doesn't have the power to set the captive free oh but I thank God that his super uh, is meeting our natural tonight uh, and that there is power in this place to deliver uh, there is power in this place uh, i wish i had a witness uh, to the power of god uh, i wish i had so can y'all hear me in the back so as i was saying before there is this appeal to working people up and if it almost gives the appearance that if you're not responding to him again that you're dead or that you're just not getting it but notice that there whenever someone is talking about how fervent they are or how passionate they are and i believe that this type of teaching when teaching about lukewarm christianity in this movement is based on what you do um and not ultimately resting first and foremost not that you you're not supposed to do things because we know that works don't save us but that we're saved for good works Ephesians 2.10 would affirm this to us, that we are his workmanship, that we are created for good things for those who are in Christ. So God in his sovereignty and in his grace and his mercy, he saves us. He calls us from spiritual death to life. He adopts us. He cleanses us from our unrighteousness. And he gives us a new nature, that he, he transforms us and that can, that's only done by the power of God, by his gospel. And this is another thing that I'm going to strongly disagree with Isaiah on in this video, that I'd never heard the gospel ministered. Not once did I hear the gospel ministered. Now, the gospel he ministers is miracle signs and wonders and casting demons out of born-again Christians. That's the gospel that he ministers. Never once did I hear. I heard the cross mentioned once during this entire service, once. But there was no call of salvation as far as the effectual call presenting the gospel according to scripture about the death burial resurrection of jesus christ about your need for christ as a sinner for those who do not know christ and and are unregenerated and for those who are in christ we need the reminder of the gospel every single day we do not graduate from the gospel it is what saves us it is the power of god unto salvation for those who will hear and that will repent and trust in Christ. And that's another thing too, is that you'll hear this call, well, you got to repent, you've got to repent. And that's a partial gospel. But he's gonna say that he's ministering the full gospel of, well, you gotta repent, be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then you're gonna do the things that Jesus did, meaning miracle signs and wonders, cast out demons. Let me just tell you this, uh, friend, a gospel without the cross is a Christless gospel. It's a Christless Christianity. If you're going to minister and not say the gospel ever and not tell people 
that are lost in sin, if they're habitually living a life of sin and they're not broken by that, meaning there's no brokenness or contrition in their life to demonstrate of godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow that 2 Corinthians 7.10 talks about, and you're just going to tell them, oh, you just need demons cast out of you, and then we're going to get you filled up, you know, get you amped up, and that way you can go do this, 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 and this, and pray harder and fast longer and do all these other things in your life, and then that will get you to heaven. Come on now, that is workspace. That's a workspace gospel. That's not good news. But see the dichotomy here. So again, we go back to this whole thing of you got to be fervent, meaning hyper emotional. You got to show that you really love God. You've got you've got to you got to get all in. You got to go all in, is what they'll tell you. You got to go all in for God. What do you mean by that? Go all in. Are you the example? Because that's the other thing, too, when I'm listening to this, is that it seems like Isaiah or whoever is speaking or Vlad or David Digger Hernandez or Daniel Adams or whoever is speaking on this, that they're the example. They are all in. So that means you need to be all in. But what is all in? What does that even mean? So then we're going to go after this religious spirit. And we're going to say, oh, they're attacking. That's why. And, and they're trying to tear down this next move of God. And that's something that you hear quite a bit. And so those people are, are viewed as being dead or they're the lukewarm Christians. But essentially what, and so they're viewed as dead. But what Isaiah, you'll hear him talk about uh, with lukewarm Christianity, like Chuck E. Cheese, Burger King, Gummy Bear Christianity, some of them have referred to it like this. They, they view it in this type of capacity. And again, we'll get into the end of this as far as what does that mean in Scripture and why does it matter? Because it does matter. But let's get back to some of the things that Isaiah is going to be telling some of the people in this crowd. It's time to war against the power of religion. Well, brother, the Bible says true and adulterated religion is keeping after the orphan and the widow. What churches are doing that? Time. Don't come I have laid my life down. So before you try to come up to me and tell me what you think I don't know about how you shouldn't bash the church, I am not bashing the church. I am bashing the harlot of Babylon that we have called the American church that has robbed God of his power, that has shut the mouth of the prophets, that has watered down the gospel. And friend, a water, don't get me started tonight, y'all. I didn't bring a watch up here, so I don't know how long I have. A watered down gospel is no gospel at all now there are points that Isaiah makes through what he says that I would agree with and this is one of them is that there is a watered-down gospel that American Christianity is not biblical Christianity if you take a look at it you prospering or me prospering in our health wealth and such and getting everything that we want from God that is not biblical Christianity so I would agree with Isaiah on that there are points that he made he talked about Satan being in this world, that he is the little God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. He talked about how um, hell is not his kingdom, so to speak. There are things that Isaiah says that are agreeable or truth from Scripture. At the same time, the concern I, the main concern I have is where is the gospel in this? Because that is what we are told to proclaim as believers in Christ, the gospel. And he does not believe that the gospel by itself, testifying of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is sufficient. If he did, that's what he would preach, but he doesn't. He does not. In this video, at least, he doesn't. And I've heard him minister in other parts, and you, you're going to hear him today say that he believes that if you don't have the gospel without deliverance and miracle signs and wonders, it is not the gospel. And... I would say the burden is on him to say, then you need to provide that in Scripture where it says that. Why did Paul not mention the working of miracle signs and wonders as far as for the believer to do consistently in 1 Corinthians 15 when he laid out what the gospel was to the Corinthian church? And furthermore, it is a logical fallacy and it is a false dichotomy to tell someone that questions their beliefs and their teachings that they don't believe in miracles and and uh healing today that god does them i do believe that i believe that god still heals and he does miracles today the difference is i do not believe that there are people that have those specific gifts that we see in scripture because they're not matching up and to question that is not questioning god himself and you'll also hear that he appeals to scripture but then um, later on in the service at one point he makes a reference and it's not a new reference but he makes a reference to those that uh, worship the Bible, the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. 
And I, I would just say this, as I've said before, um, you cannot divorce the Holy Spirit from his word. The Holy Spirit inspired scripture. So if you're going to use scripture, or if I'm going to use scripture, then we need to understand who authored it. It was dual authorship. It was by a man who was carried along by the Holy Spirit, and it's divinely inspired, and it's authoritative, and it's sufficient. And to make such remarks while quoting scripture throughout seems hypocritical. So if you're going to say that, but then you're going to say, well, you just worship the Bible. I don't worship the Bible. I worship the God that's testified of in the Bible. That is the only way that I can know the true living God is from hearing the gospel, as Romans 10, 17 says, and by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, who also helps to illuminate the word to me to understand it rightly so. So that way I'm not carried along by every wind of doctrine that Ephesians 4 talks about, and growing instead into spiritual maturity. So I'm probably going to be a little passionate and fervent in this video today because of some of the things that were said, but I can do that in such a way that I'm not yelling and screaming at you and beating you with a stick uh, in order to get the point across, I would hope at least. But I, I think you you probably get what I'm trying to convey here is that you're, you're going to see, and uh, I don't know Isaiah's heart on the matter, um, I don't know his intentions. I'm sure that he's he has great zeal, obviously, um, but we can have zeal and not have a proper knowledge in the Word of God. That's something we need to be aware of. Um, and and when we're saying things like this, that there's there's res massive weight of responsibility behind this when you're saying this is the gospel, but you're not even presenting the gospel, and then you're attacking people um, in such a way across the aisle that you're not doing it in a biblical way. It's just ad hominem attacks with the name calling, with the berating, and then making logical fallacies, straw man arguments, and not even presenting the other side in a fair and an objective way. You'll die and magically go to heaven. But I came to tell somebody that the only way to gain entrance into the kingdom of God is by a life that is laid down to the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I want to be your Lord. That deliverance is not a get out of jail free card. Deliverance empowers you to live like the person of Jesus. Oh, help me. Help me preach, Holy Ghost. Deliverance is so I can more effectively live like Jesus. Because I keep getting angry, and that's not what Jesus has for my life. See, so Isaiah just said the only way to get into heaven is to have a life laid down for Christ. Is that the way we get into heaven? And the reason I ask that question is because of the things that are said in this teaching that he does two years ago to this crowd of people that's called a revival service. It seems as if there's a trust in what you do instead of what Christ has done for you on the cross. We rest in his finished work. There is no other way that we get into heaven. It is through Christ and Christ alone, by grace, through faith in Christ alone, through him being crucified for our sins, being buried and raised from the dead in accordance with Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, specifically verses uh, when you go through one through four, you can find this. That is what the gospel is. Now. Is the gospel without deliverance the gospel? No. Is the gospel without miracles the gospel? No. Is the gospel without repentance? Because that's what it's all about is repenting for the kingdom of God is at hand. The first words that Jesus preached is repent. There's no way around it, friend. If you want your sin in God at the same time, you can't. You will go to hell. Be so he's now saying, and he's said it in other times before, that the full gospel must have casting demons out of Christians and miracle signs and wonders accompanying. Otherwise, it's not the gospel. Is that the gospel? This has nothing to do, nothing to do with believing a particular way that has an ism assigned to it. This is about just reading scripture, <laughs> just flat out reading scripture in context and seeing what it says. But you're also going to hear Isaiah say this. 
hell being in church praying the sinner's prayer well we prayed the prayer jesus said they called me lord and they will say lord 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 in other words they confess with their mouth that jesus is lord this is what pastors teach you they say oh brother just repeat a prayer that's not in the bible and have jesus come build a three-story guatemalan treehouse in your heart and friend that's not what jesus preached jesus said they will call me lord they will have said the sinner's prayer saying lord come into my life but they will live like like I'm not the Lord of their life at all. They will live void of the Lordship of Christ. And friend, Jesus is not just your king, not just your savior. He is your ruler. He is the Lord that is above every Lord. And so when I come to Christ, I don't get to watch the movies anymore. And this is where I think it's very problematic for him in his teaching because he's saying the full gospel requires deliverance for the christian miracles signs and wonders but then he turns around and he doesn't reference what scripture it is and that that's not an issue necessarily but he's referencing matthew 7 21 through 23 is what it sounds like and this is referencing false prophets in that time when you read it in context and jesus is saying in that last day or in that time they will say to me lord lord did we not we, and it says nothing about a sinner's prayer that they prayed a sinner's prayer and he doesn't agree with the sinner's prayer and I would agree with Isaiah. There is no sinner's prayer that we are told, nothing concocted or scripted that we are to pray. This is, this is a, a heart change that God brings in bringing us to understand our need for Christ, our need for salvation because of our sin and rebellion against a holy God who brings justice and judgment. And if he didn't, he would not be a just God. But Isaiah is going to use a verse to validate his belief in this, and he's, he's contradicting himself. So you hear him on one side saying the full gospel is this, but then he's saying, oh, there's these people that are going to stand before Jesus, and they're going to, he's not even using it in the proper context. You all read your Bible, pick it up and read it. When somebody references a scripture, I don't care if they're talking 60 miles an hour, pick it up and read it. Because what he's referencing is referencing false prophets who will prophesy and cast out demons and do all the mighty works in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says to them, I don't know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity and lawlessness. These people were resting in their own merit. They were not resting in the sufficiency of what Christ would do for them. And Christ's work on the cross is sufficient. And if we have to add anything to it in order to validate it, it's another gospel. Nate, God says, here's the thing. There's no carnal weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So I don't use a sniper rifle. I am a spiritual sniper. I don't use physical weapons. So my weapons then are supernatural inherently. So then when I worship, I'm launching missiles into the enemy's kingdom. When I shout demonic foundations that have been here for 150 years are being shook by the power of God. The Bible says the man manifest wisdom of God is made known through the church to powers and principalities. I came to give a principality a headache. I came to evict a demon. And I come to put every demonic spirit on notice that you will not stay in Jesus' name. That every demon will be homeless in Jesus' name. I came to crash the devil's stock market. We're taxing the devil tonight. And then when you're referring to yourself as a spiritual sniper and, you know, all of these things that show how powerful you are, again, it is pointing to you. It is not pointing to God. It is not pointing to Christ. It is pointing to you as the little, the little God that is on this earth and that you're wielding all of this power and authority. Oh, my goodness. I, I just hope that people would see that. And, and especially Isaiah, I, I hope that people would see that and understand that to know what that sounds like. And again, you're placing burdens on people. You're telling them you need to wield this. Look at me. I'm the standard. And that's what when I was listening to this video, that's what it seemed like. And that may not be the intention of Isaiah or Vlad or any of these people that hold to this, but they are holding themselves up as the standard of what. It is to look fervent and on fire for God 
rather than saying, you need to go back to God's word to understand what it looks like to be on fire for God. If you can't see that on the podcast and air quotes on fire, what does that mean? What does that look like to have a fervency, a heat about my faith in Christ that I'm unashamed of the gospel and I don't need to change the gospel in order to make it more um, palatable. I don't need to change the gospel in, in, into making it more um, powerful, more um, authoritative. There's nothing that I need to do to change it. What Christ did on the cross is sufficient. And here's what Paul is trying to tell us. Why are you so worried about things that won't matter in a hundred years? Why are you, think about right now in the last seven days, because uh, it, it convicts me too, that's why I'm preaching it. In the last seven days, what have you done that's going to matter in a hundred years? How did pastor one so day? So Isaiah says to the people here, you know, what, basically focusing on what kind of legacy are you going to leave? And uh, what, what are you doing that's going to matter in a hundred years? And it's again, focusing on you, focusing on self. There's a man named uh, Zinzendorf that lived several hundred years ago, and he has a very famous quote. It says, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. It does not matter what you do or what I do for the, that counts for the next hundred years of who's going to remember it. If you're not proclaiming the gospel, then it's all wood, hay, and stubble. It'll burn up. That's not, we're not to worry about that stuff like that. And all of us do think about that. I've thought about that before of with my children, but as time continues to go on with my children, the most important thing in their life is knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I can't save them. I can't do that for them. I am to proclaim the gospel to them, share the gospel with them, and to raise them in the ways of the Lord and pray and trust that the Lord is going to begin that work in them because I can't save them. Th this whole thing of telling people, well, what are you going to do? What kind of legacy are you going to leave? Do you know how holy I am? Not even saying it that way necessarily, but do you know I'm sold out, brother? I'm sold out, sister. I'm all in for God. I pray and I fast, which scripture tells us not to tell people you know, we shouldn't be going around telling people how much we pray and how much we fast. All of these things that we can think about. But we don't need to be telling people how spiritual we are. Our life will demonstrate that. And that will provide opportunities for us not to say, oh, yeah, I'm just spiritual. I pray and I fast all the time. And I read my word and I go to church and I'm, and I'm there every time the doors open. And I do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And instead, we should be pointing people back to Christ. I, it's by His grace that I am who I am. Because apart from Him, I deserved judgment because of my sin and rebellion against Him. And in His grace and mercy, He saved me. And this is how He saved me, through sending His Son to die for me on the cross because justice was necessary. Payment had to be made for my sin. And Jesus paid it in full once and for all. And then he rose from the dead in three days. And now because of him, I have the promise of eternal life all because of him. And he's washed me clean and he's reconciled me to the father. And now I'm adopted into the family of God. That's how I know Christ. That's why I've been changed. And the call is to repent and put your trust in him. Put your trust in the gospel, the only thing that can save you. That's the legacy we're supposed to leave. Don't get wrapped up in all this stuff and think that you have to jump through all these hoops and do all these things. Listen, you want to pray for several hours a day? If God graces you to do that, then praise the Lord. If God graces you to fast and you, and you feel convicted over certain things, then fast. I would encourage you to do it in a biblical way and not because you're looking to get something from God. I would do it in a way that you wouldn't draw attention to yourself and even study what, what biblical fasting looks like. Because, this again, this is something in this movement that has been twisted and warped. 
And then it's made about you. Oh, I did this 40 day fast. Oh, I did this Daniel fast. Look how spiritual I am. This and then this happened because I did all this fasting and did all this praying. And I'm just going to continue to do that. And then other people will look at that and they may think, well, I can't do that. So I must not be as spiritual as so and so is. And we'll get to that. I want to share some things, but let's listen a little bit more to Isaiah. I know, I know that deliverance is going to matter in 150 years. I know that miracles are going to matter. The supernatural is going to matter. Why? Because I'm going to get before God and there's going to be thousands of people that got saved and delivered in our meetings. And because of their deliverance and healing, they served God. They died and went to heaven and I'll be able to see them for eternity. That is what matters. My TikTok is not going to matter. Come on. Instagram is not going to matter. And God is saying today, it's time to take our eyes off the natural and it's time to open up our spiritual eyes it's time to live in the spirit it's time to pray in the spirit it's time for our priorities to be God now, I'm a little concerned with something he said and I, I would like some clarity if possible on it but he says there will be people that are healed and delivered through his ministry and because they were healed and delivered and then they serve God, they will be in heaven for eternity. Is that correct? I mean, again, we go back to how does one enter the kingdom of heaven? It is not by your works. Ephesians 2 even encourages us in this. By grace through faith you have been saved, and not of good works, so that no one may boast. It is the gift of God. It is freely given. Christ freely laid down his life, and he freely took it up again. He was resurrected. And so we've got this, these statements here that are troubling. And then when there's no gospel, again, there's no gospel of the, of the finished work of Christ on the cross in this. None. I mean, this, this is all pointing to works, of someone's works. It's very concerning to hear that type of teaching and talk because you're putting false assurance in something that has happened to somebody as far as, you you healing them or you saying that you cast demons out of them and then they're serving your ministry or serving the Lord in, in your um, interpretation of it. But there's no gospel in here. There, this is, again, a crossless Christianity right here. I, I'm telling you, I watched this video and one time the cross was mentioned. There was no gospel presentation in this entire video of of laying out what the gospel is and, and i've shared that other times i shared it last week in the interview i did with janine at the end of that video if you want to check that out that there's a about a three or four minute video a clip at the end that shares the gospel but th this is this is a big issue this is a serious matter here because people are not hearing the gospel they're hearing pietism in my opinion they're hearing you need to go back and you can do all of these things and this is what saves you you need to repent. Yes, you need to repent, but that's a partial message that's being ministered to people. You don't just repent. You're putting your trust in Christ to save you. It's not of your own doing. It's not. And I, I don't think that Isaiah believes that it's our own doing, but he's saying things that lead to that conclusion was in the spirit every day i live for god i'm not a part-time christian i'm a full-time devil stomping tongue talking holy ghost filled christian and they went from that and all of a sudden life happened and they bought a car they couldn't afford and they got a job they had to work overtime and they bought a house that they had to work overtime for and their kids grew up and they got married and they had kids and now i got to go to band practice and she has to go to cheerleading and my son's the star football player at the high school and I got my this and that and everything became about them and building their life and the Lord speaks through the prophet like he's speaking through me tonight and says why do you keep saying now's not the time to build my house this is why I used to think Daniel when I'm 30 when I'm 35 I used to think when I was 16 17 partying drinking doing everything I could do to the world I used to think when I'm 30 or 35 then I'll build the kingdom then I'll serve God I God didn't even believe in complete atheist I'll go to church like you're supposed to at 35 friend let me just say this idea that God is some boring thing that we do at 30 years old on Sunday morning that is dead we are killing every religious mindset and I came to tell somebody that God is exciting that God is fun that revival is not boring. The only thing boring is you. You're so boring. 
You will literally sit for four hours watching The Office and you're gonna come tell me God's boring. I just don't really know. I'm not into that whole God thing. Yet you waited four hours to watch a little guy sling around spider webs from building to building, a little kid show. And you dressed up as spy. You have all the trophies, all the cards, all. I knew y'all weren't going to shout here. And you lined up to go to Disney World and to be frozen. And all. You are frozen. You're frozen in God. And God is saying, when are you going to get to a place where you go, wait a minute. I'm so busy with this world that I forgot that it's all about God. Isaiah, I'm getting radical because I'm with Daniel Adams. Are you saying that it's my whole life has to be about God? Are you saying? So I don't, yeah, so I don't know if any of you all remember hearing anything like this in this movement. I sure did and certainly subscribed to some of these types of beliefs, but people would be berated, um, whether indirectly on the platform or maybe directly, I don't know to the about um not being there on wednesday nights because they're they didn't uh, make the priority and that they're putting their kids uh school or their um, extracurricular activities above god and um you'll hear isaiah at different points he talks about how he doesn't go to the movies um and that's his way of one of his um, markers of saying that he's sold out for god and that he doesn't go out to eat dinner with with people and different things. And so it crosses into this this line of legalism. Now, if he's convicted over those things, you don't you're convicted over not wanting to watch movies, fine. But that's not prescriptive for you to be a holy Christian and to be all in for God. Your kids playing extracurricular activities uh, does not mean that you're not all in for God. You wanting to have maybe a family night of playing game, board games or watching a movie with your family uh, and having that time together is not you not being all in for God. This is legalism. This is what this boils down to. It is legalism. Now, there are some people, I get what he's trying to say to a certain point. He's trying to make distinctions and, and say, you know, there's lines in the sand as a believer that because of Christ, we are to set standards in our life. We're not to be like the world. And I, I get that aspect. So I want to be fair in that perspective of it. I get what he's trying to say on that. But to prescribe your own personal convictions to your life that are not black and white in Scripture is, is not solid teaching to bring to somebody. It puts shackles on people and burdens on people that are unnecessary. Because it's almost as if you're saying, I'm the standard of holiness and, and being blameless before God because I don't go to secular movies and I don't go out to restaurants and go with people and sit with them and, uh, and just hang out. And my kids don't play sports. <laughs> we, no, we don't do that. So, you know, you create this, this standard where you're the standard instead of going, okay, Who's the standard here? Uh, yeah, Christ is the standard. And who's to say that your son or daughter, God would not in his, in his sovereignty and providence use your son or daughter in an extracurricular activity to minister to another child? Who are you to say that? Who are you to say that that couldn't possibly happen and that God works all things for his glory, which we know he does? So I think we need to be very careful in that we obviously we we don't want to look like the world we won't want to be like the world there's certain things that we need to have wisdom about we need to be praying we need to have wisdom about them we need to to test them and to make sure that it's not something that's having a bad witness um to others that are un, even unbelievers but we also don't want to set up this standard among believers and saying oh well because i do these certain things or don't do them then that's the standard you need to live up to. And I'm all in for God, but you must not be all in because you don't do what I do. You see what I'm saying here? It creates this hierarchy of Christianity that does not exist in the Bible or in God's kingdom for that matter. God? Are you saying there's, come on. I, I had a friend who's an influencer, whatever that means. And he's just like, 
come on, bro. He's like, I know you watch movies. You're like, you're not telling me you don't watch movies and you don't go out to eat with people and you don't drink. And you're, you're not telling me like, you don't, you and your wife don't go to the new movie that comes out, the new love. And he's naming all these things. I'm like, no, literally I'm talking about every single day, every waking moment. I am consumed by the power, the presence, the anointing, the fire of God. Well, what about your hobby? He's my hobby. Deliverance is my hobby. Miracles are my hobby. Prayer is what would, what would, what would happen if someone said, what's your hobby and you said prayer okay we got a demon in the in the speaker there prayer's my hobby worship's my hobby you know what happened pastors would stop having to go on sabbaticals because they burned out I would burn out too if I was you. If I was preaching with no power, never seeing miracles, never seeing deliverances, never having prayer meetings, never seeing the power of God, you don't need a sabbatical, Pastor. You need deliverance. You need to get free from every gizmo and gadget and trinket and vice of this world and to go all in for God. And this preaching scares you because you still want the world and adding God to it. And See, this is the other thing that really is is upsetting uh, is the fact that because if a if a pastor uh, a leader a man of god of a church questions what isaiah is doing and those those that are doing the types of things that he's doing and they're saying hold on a minute you know is the gospel being ministered which by the way once again the gospel according to scripture was not ministered in this video never was and I will stand by that. I watched it twice. It was not ministered, ever. There was no presentation of the gospel. Secondly, there is a berating of pastors that don't do deliverance ministry on born-again Christians, of believing that Christians need indwelling demons cast out of them, which Scripture does not support. That diminishes the gospel, which if, if you think it couldn't be diminished enough in this video, then you would be wrong because it was, it was already non-existent. And now it's further diminished by believing that Christians need indwelling demons cast out of them. And then telling pastors, you know, I'd burn out too if I didn't have all of these things basically that Isaiah does and others do that they believe is where the power is. What if what you're doing is not that powerful? What if it's false? What if it's unbiblical? What if it's leading people into deception? Is that powerful? And how do you know that these pastors aren't having prayer meetings or that they aren't praying or that they aren't serving orphans or widows? How do you know that? How do you know that they're not ministering to their communities? How do you know what the fruit of their life is? Because you're just assuming Isaiah, you're assuming that all of these people, because they don't agree with you and because they're not all in as to what you define as being all in, then they couldn't possibly be sold out for God. What does that even mean to be sold out for God? Is that resting in what he's done and that I want to live my life to the glory of Christ, recognizing that I am going to fall short and sin and miss the mark every day in some way, shape, or capacity. Because let me just be honest with you, there are days that I feel dry. There are days that there's things that happen that cause me to be weary. There are days when I am on fire, as like some people like to say, or what they would deem all in. And any of those days, I am constantly reminded of my need for Christ not resting in my own sufficiency, not resting in what I can do or how many times a day I prayed when I had a moment, which let's, the, and then the whole use of the word hobby, please don't do that for using that for, the, for uh, prayer. Let it be a lifestyle that you live throughout the day. Going back to what scripture says, we are to pray continually. So find moments and opportunities in your day, even when you're on Facebook, you see something, you scroll across and someone's saying, I need prayer. Take a moment just to stop and pray for that person. It doesn't have to be eloquent. No one has to know it. No one has to see it. And you can take a very short period of time to pray for that person and utilize that time for God's glory in that. You see, it's almost in this movement as if it's all or nothing. But yet these people want to use these social media platforms in order to get their message out. <laughs> so 
you know, again, use wisdom, use wisdom with what you're watching. If you get convicted that you're spending too much time on social media, then take time away from that. But don't make that prescriptive and telling everyone, well, you're not like me and on fire like me because I, for, I have forsaken all of this for a period of time. You're setting yourself up as the standard of holiness and you're not the standard. If anything, we should be humbled in knowing we can't measure up. We can, it, no matter if it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Do you know of anybody that has done that perfectly every moment of their life? I know of one in his earthly ministry, that's Jesus Christ. I don't know of anybody else that's been able to do that. And any of these people that try to tell you that they've done that, they're lying to you. They're lying and they're deceiving themselves. And they need Christ. They need Christ and they need the reminder. Just like the Old Testament shows us, it's a mirror up to our faces to show us we need Christ. We're lawbreakers. None of us can live up to the law. We put our trust in the one who did. He did it sinlessly and he did it with perfection. And that's the standard to get into heaven is perfection. Have you attained that? I certainly haven't, but thank God I'm, it's not dependent on me. It's dependent on Christ and what he's done. And thank God for his Holy Spirit indwelling us as believers who is sanctifying us day by day and conforming us to the image of Christ. Thank God for his grace, my goodness. Thank the good Lord for his grace. Thank the good Lord for his grace and his mercy that I know that I need every day. That's the message you need to hear is the gospel. You need to hear of the grace and the mercy that God would extend to you through his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for you, knowing there is nothing you can do, nothing. No deliverance, no signs and wonders, no matter how many people you lay hands on, no matter how many times a day you fast, no matter how many times a day you pray, no matter how many times a day you, you're speaking in tongues, that, that you subscribe to a prayer language, none of that. Your assurance is in Christ alone. If it's not, then you need to judge yourself to see if you're even in the faith. So now that we've heard from Isaiah Saldivar, and I've talked a little bit about some of the thoughts that I have regarding some of the things he said. Again, there are things he said that I would agree with, but there are some concerning things he said that I very much disagree with. And the biggest thing is there was zero presentation of the gospel according to scripture. That's not just a watered down gospel. That's no gospel at all. So I know that I played one of the clips where he was talking about that. And as far as he's passionate about the gospel, I pray that he would consider that he knows what the gospel is because I didn't hear it in this. And I'm, I'm concerned that he believes that he did minister it. But I want to share with you just for a few minutes from this article on um, Bob DeWay's website that talks about pietism, because there were a few things that when listening to this type of teaching and reflecting on it in the past, it reminded me of this. And then I'm going to share a few clips with you. Um, to help us understand better about what it means as far as being a lukewarm Christian and the passage in Revelation 3. Bob DeWay says this about pietism, and I'll put the link down below as I said, but he says the essence of pietism is this. It is a practice designed to lead to an experience that purports to give one an elite or special status compared to ordinary Christians. The Bible addresses this error in the book of Colossians. The false teachers in Colossae claimed to have the secret to a superior Christian experience that would cause people to rise above the bad fate they feared. Paul went on to explain that they had already had everything they needed through Christ and his work on the cross. Another way of stating this is, if after having fully trusted Christ's finished work on the cross, you were told that you are still lacking something, you are being taught pietism. And in this article, he goes on to quote Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. 
if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to the things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. DeWay goes on to say, Paul calls this approach self-made religion, which is exactly what all forms of pietism are. They all suggest that having been converted by the Lord through the cross and practicing his ordained means of grace by faith are inadequate. They have discovered a better way that leads to a higher order experience. Paul says they have the appearance of wisdom. These are ascetic practices, DeWay notes, that God is happier with a Christian who prays longer or fasts longer. And that's the type of mindset that can be had in these belief systems. He says pietism misdiagnoses the problem and creates a false solution. It sees a compromised church that is apparently caught in dead orthodoxy. The real problem is not dead orthodoxy, but spiritually dead sinners who give mental assent to orthodox truth, but show no signs of regeneration. If indeed such a church existed, if truth really is there, God has his remnant there as well. That church would be characterized by worldliness and sin. This is the case because dead sinners do not bear spiritual fruit. There was a church in Revelation that Jesus called dead. Pietism that holds to the true gospel but goes beyond its imagining that the dead sinners who are church members are Christians. When some of them become regenerate through the efforts of the pietists, they assume they have now entered a higher class of Christianity. They posit two types of Christian, carnal Christians and spiritual Christians. But in reality, there are only Christians and dead sinners. Furthermore, pietism sees the lack of good fruit in the dead Orthodox churches to be a sign that teaching doctrines is of no value and that what really matters is practice and not doctrine. So they gravitate to works righteousness. Pietists think that adding some man-made process to what Christ has provided for all Christians throughout the centuries can cure a problem that never existed, and that is being dead because of believing the truth. Instead of a cure, they create an illness as they lead people away from the finished work of Christ. So I wanted to share some of that from the article, and I would encourage you to read the entire article. He even focuses on some in this about 1 Corinthians 3 and how that's misused by those who would hold to this type of belief system. But now I want to play for you um, some clips from, uh, one is from For the Gospel with Costi Hinn, talking about what it means to be a lukewarm Christian. And then the last one is from Chad Bird, where he talks about Revelation 3 and what lukewarm actually meant in that passage. It's a great question we should all have an answer to. So here are four thoughts to think through. Number one, lukewarm Christianity may not be Christianity. There may be times where you have seasons of struggle or don't necessarily feel close to God, or you may have moments where you're not as motivated to pray or read the word or evangelize the lost. It's in these moments that we seek out accountability and teaching and then we grow, but a lifestyle of that kind of lukewarm living is the mark of someone who's not a genuine believer. Jesus offers a sobering warning to the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3 verse 15 saying, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I'm rich and I've become wealthy and I have no need of anything. And you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to apply to your eyes so you may see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Jesus was essentially saying, you're not the real deal. You need to repent. You need to follow me. I hope that you have ears to hear and eyes to see. Jesus calls to the lukewarm to repent. Therefore, the mark of a genuine believer doesn't include habitual laziness when it comes to their faith. Take it from Christ. Lukewarm is a label for the false Christian. Another sign that you're a lukewarm Christian, you're lazy with your sin. Lukewarm Christianity is like a dog that eats and naps but never wants to go for a walk. 
Sin left unchecked is like cancer untreated. Eventually, it will kill you. You've got to take action when it comes to your sin. Another mark of the lukewarm Christian is you're lazy with church. God designed the gathering of the saints to be a place where you're spurred on towards love and good works. And that's what Hebrews 10 verses 24 to 26 describes. When you're lazy with church, you say things like, I am the church. I don't need to go to church. That's like an arm cutting itself off and saying, I am the body. I don't need to be connected to this body. Spiritual amputation is the quickest way to find yourself not alive in Christ, but spiritually dead and disconnected. Another sign that you're a lukewarm Christian, you're lazy with spiritual disciplines. Colossians 4.2 commands us to be devoted to prayer. 1 Peter 2.2 says, like newborn babes long for the pure spiritual milk of the word so that by it you may grow with respect to your salvation. When you're lazy with spiritual disciplines like reading and praying, you're neglecting the spiritual food God uses to fill you, grow you, and nourish your soul. Without these, you're on the road to spiritual malnourishment. Do you notice something about every point that I've listed? Each one is not the mark of how a genuine believer lives. And there is the deeper question I want you to ask. Not, how do I know if I'm a lukewarm Christian, but rather, if I am habitually lukewarm, am I a Christian at all? I pray that the truth finds your heart. What does it mean to be a lukewarm Christian who's in danger of Christ spitting you out of his mouth? Well, let's first of all deal with a very widespread misconception about this part of Revelation chapter 3, which is Christ's message to the church at Laodicea. Typically, the way this hot and cold and lukewarm is interpreted is that hot is fully committed, you're on fire for God, and cold is fully uncommitted. So it's explained, according to this interpretation, that Jesus is saying, you know, I wish you were fully committed, hot, or fully uncommitted, cold, but you're not, you're in the middle, you're lukewarm, you have a half-hearted commitment to, to me. Well, the, first of all, the problem with that interpretation is that there's nothing in the text whatsoever to suggest that cold is bad or that cold is uncommitted. In fact, it makes perfect sense, both according to our own usage of water still today, as well as the geographical context of Laodicea, that hot and cold were both good. So you had nearby the, the hot springs, the hot water, which were used for medicinal purposes, just like hot springs are still used that way today at a place called Hierapolis. And so you had that close by, hot water, good. But then you also had, pretty close by, at Colossae, cold water, good for, good for drinking. So hot water, good. Cold water, good. But Laodicea had a problem. They didn't have enough water where they were located, so water had to be piped in, had to be brought in. By the time it reached the, reached the city, guess what? It was lukewarm. It was tepid. And so when you took a drink of it, you felt like spitting it out of your mouth. Vomiting it out of your mouth is literally what Jesus says in, in Revelation 3 when he says you're lukewarm and therefore you are in danger of me vomiting you out of my mouth. So when the Laodicean Christians heard this particular metaphor of lukewarm, they would immediately have understood what Jesus was talking about because he's describing the very experience that they have drinking the water there in, in Laodicea. So cold is good. Hot is good. Both these waters are good. It's not as if one is fully committed and one is fully uncommitted. No, they're both good. Jesus says, I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were a hot good or a cold good. But as it is, you're not. You're lukewarm. Now, wh why were they lukewarm? Well, read the, the, the rest of the message that Jesus presents to them. And the message is basically this. You, you think that you're rich. That You think that you're, you're doing great. You, th you have all this kind of spiritual arrogance going on. You are unaware of your need of me. That's, that's your problem. You think that you're rich, but you're poor. You think that you're just decked out in all this finery, well, you're naked. You think that you're healthy, but you're sick. You are full of yourself, he's saying to the church. And because of that, your witness to the people around you is, has been compromised. There's a possibility that they were compromising with the local pagan practices, idolatrous practices, and as a result of this, they were becoming materially wealthy. That's certainly one possibility. But either way, they're unaware blind to their own insufficiency, and also then blind to what Christ needs to provide for them so that they can have a faithful witness there in, in Laodicea. And one more thing about this whole lukewarm uh, metaphor. Remember that Jesus is not speaking to an individual. He's speaking to the church at Laodicea. So it is a, is, it's a corporate problem. Now, of course, it involves the individuals who are there, but he's speaking to the church. And so as we, as we apply this, as we preach or teach upon this, keep that in mind as well. It's, it's a corporate problem of the church at Laodicea that they are having. So 
Hot, good. Cold, good. Lukewarm, not good. And because of that, Jesus calls them to repent, to be aware of their own needs so that he might fill those needs and that thereby, filled with the blessings of Christ, they might actually be able to present a good and a faithful witness to the people who are around them. So I hope that this has been helpful today as we've pondered on some of the things that Isaiah said and we've looked at some of the things about pietism and the clips to help us have a better understanding of of the word lukewarm in scripture and the the context of it and what it means to be fervent in the Lord versus having potential of a, of a lukewarm tendency. And I would just encourage you to go back to the word of God, continue to be encouraged by the word and to be even challenged by it, to be corrected by it. That's what it's there for. It's to help uh, correct us and to help us grow in our spiritual understanding. And just because you have a high reverence for the word does not mean you worship the Bible. So don't fall into that trap. We do want to hold um, the word to a high standard because we believe it is God speaking and it is authoritative for our life. And in that, it has everything in it that we need to know for life and godliness. So I look forward to being with you next time as we cover another topic. Until that time comes, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.